All right, we are back with uh, our 12 o'clock workshop with Darian, and she is going to be walking us through how to paint a pretty fall chestnut pony. Love it. I've got my little sample here, if you can see it. Beautiful. Love all the shading. Perfect for the fall weather. Yes. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I guess we can just kind of yeah, right in. Let's get right it. into it. Hey. <laughs> um, so predominantly my painting method usually is done with the airbrush, but I know that that isn't something that a lot of people have access to or want to spend the money investing into. So I've painted this little chestnut stable mate using only acrylic paints that you can find at the dollar store and um, basic brushes. So it is possible to create shading and all of the lovely softness with using just acrylic paints. So for this tutorial, I am using just these paints I had on hand, which are deco art. Um, they came from the dollar store. They have a dollar 79 price tag on them. <laughs> And I have just various, very used, very loved, old, whatever you can find will work for this. Um, you will need the certain colors for this particular chestnut tone. So I started with this tan color and then a slightly darker tan color, which is called soft suede, but depending on what brand of paint you're using, it could be different. Then you'll need a yellow, Ours here. A, a red, and a burnt umber. And burnt umber is pretty standard across the board. You can usually find that. Um, and then the kind of detailing phase, we're going to need a black and a white. You can buy a preset gray color if you want to, but that's not needed. You can mix your own gray using black and white. And then the biggest thing for that I've found for painting with these lesser quality paints is using this folk art blending gel. Now you don't have to use this. You can get away with just water, but this is a game changer. <laughs> <laughs> and this was actually recommended to me by Stephanie Blaylock. She predominantly paints with this and acrylics and her stuff is amazing. So it is possible and this helps a lot. <laughs> so I'm going to be using this today, um, but I'll show you how to do it with just water as well. It just takes a bit more time and a bit more finessing, but the blending gel makes things go a lot faster. Um, and then I have just some miniature brushes that I bought in some kind of miniature paint set. So I really like these flat square brushes. I find that I use that for majority of the horse. And then I have like a very a smaller detail one for the, the areas in the face, especially being a stable mate is quite small. If you wanna get really crazy, you can get a really fine paintbrush for the details like the eye and the nose and the hooves and stuff. And I did use that on this particular sample. You kind of have to. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're just gonna be kind of focusing on the body. So this slightly smaller brush will be sufficient. Um, sometimes I find it's good to wear gloves uh, if you're holding the model and you're painting with the model, um, so that you don't get your oily fingerprints over everything and it's easier. I'm not going to today, but you definitely can, uh, if you're not wanting to mess up any of your paintwork, you're going to need some water. So I have this really fancy paint jar, but you, anything works, um, and something to put your paints on. I actually really like using just container lids, <laughs> yeah. um, wash the wash up really easy and you can reuse them several times by scrubbing and scraping the paint off of them. So I keep all of my recycling. <laughs> Good way to reuse. <laughs> <laughs> and you're gonna need a piece of paper towel as well. Um, another thing with using these kind of craft acrylics, uh, it's super useful to have a hair dryer on hand. Um, this is so that you can flash dry anything that's acting too wet or not taking too much time to dry. And a misconception with acrylic is that it dries really fast. It doesn't need to cure. That's actually not true. Acrylic needs just as much time to cure as oils in certain cases. So 
if you flash cure it with this, it's also adding heat. So it's just giving it that extra little level of cure. So when you're adding more layers on top, things aren't going to be pulling up from bottom layers. So sure. I obviously have steps for everything today, so I'm not going to be using this so I don't break your eardrums. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is a good thing if you're working on one particular model and even letting that model cure overnight, it's a world of difference in the acrylic okay. world. Yeah, that's something I've learned the hard way. <laughs> okay, so starting with your StableMate model, um, I have this, this little blank um, white guy and he would have came out of Briar's Paint Your Own Horse kit. So they, they come not prepped, not primed, but there is like a coating of yes. paint over top of them. Mm -hmm. So we can choose to directly paint over top of this and that's no problem. And for the purpose of this, that's what I'll be doing. Uh, if you're at home and this is what you have, you are gonna have to prime it because we have too many colors happening here and you're not gonna be able to just directly paint over top with this kind of paint. It's quite thin, doesn't have a lot of pigment. It's not gonna stick. So in that case, you're gonna wanna prime your horse. And I do recommend priming kind of always just because it's a better bond for the acrylic paint to the primer sticking to the plastic and then the paint being able to stick to the primer. So it is a good idea to do so. It's not necessary if you do have these blanks though, they actually take the paint quite well. And you, when you're doing the priming and stuff, you can sand the horse actually and remove all the seams and different things. If I was to sand this guy down anywhere, the paint would kind of come off and it would create an unbalanced surface to paint on top of. So that's just something to think, uh, keep in mind. But if we're just practicing, we can totally just paint on this white model right off the get go. I just want to mention for anybody watching at home, if you wanted to go to YouTube, we have our chat going and we can answer any questions anybody has, and we'll just kind of ask them along. So I'm kind of looking off to this side here. I'm following along with our chat and you're already getting lots of excited fans following oh, along. <laughs> okay. Awesome. All right. So we're going to jump right into this. Um, yeah. And I actually only had for this chestnut color, I only have four layers total that created the full color. Okay. So I just started with this pre-can tan. And if you didn't have a tan, you could mix burnt umber and white and create your own tan as well. Okay. Oh, that would also work. Um, but this tan is just a nice base coat. And I found, this is deco art. I have no idea. This is just dollar store or something. I found that folk art paint is a bit thicker. I actually prefer that brand if you can get a hold of that one. So this stuff is quite thin and you're going to see when I apply it to the horse, it actually is quite thin. And generally with um, acrylic painting, you want to work in really thin layers anyways. So it's kind of a good thing that it's not going to cake on because uh, we're, we're going to be worried about brush strokes as well. You don't want things to be super chunky, but this paint, just kind of already does that. It's a very thin consistency, but you can also see that the thin consistency means that we have to do quite a few layers of this to actually make it tan. <laughs> so I think I had to use four or five layers of this to wow, actually wow. create the solid base. And you can do that really quickly in, you know, 20 minutes or so if you have a hair dryer because you can flash dry it. Uh, but it does dry pretty fast on its own because um, it's not very thick, it's quite thin. And I'm just it's using the thin layers in general. When we do stable maids painting at, you know, at retailers or at fun days or um, at other events, it's so funny, the kids just like, you know, slap on the paint, slap on the paint, I'm like, <laughs> it's not dry. <laughs> You've got more paint than pounding here. <laughs> But it, does, it, it will it will eventually cure and it will be a giant blob but it's going to take a while <laughs> you know what it's all about having fun right exactly. exactly and this was a good challenge for myself as well I don't generally just paint with acrylics so it's fun to uh 
Well, that's why we love these fun days because it teaches everybody something new and yeah. we get to experience some fun stuff. And, you know, it's not just about having the models on the shelf. It's about enjoying them and, you know, doing something fun on a Saturday. And, you know, how can you really engage with the models? Even like you said, little OF stable mates and, um, you know, just whatever you have laying around. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, that a little goes a long way with paint. Yes, I remember that. that. <laughs> All right, so I kind of have one layer there and you can see um, that it is quite streaky. It's, it's not completely opaque. And one thing that you could do in this case where the paint isn't very uh, opaque is that you could do things in the direction of the hair growth. And that's another method to make things look a little more realistic. So I did not hear, but we could paint the strokes kind of down off the shoulder into the the stomach area and then we could put that classic fan in the flank area so you could really pay attention to that and make things mm -hmm. really detailed if you wanted to which I do a lot of that in my in my work as well and I think it looks really cool so they're basically going to do that until you end up with a solid opaque horse Okay. So you can see that oh, that's wow. different. Yeah. 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 The tan is quite thick there. And I do have a little bit of paint streaking here. And if things get too textured, you could take a bit of light sandpaper and sand it down if you had a weird bump or lump or anything. Um, but yeah, basically this guy is all dry and he you said that took about five or six coats, three, four or five coats, did you say? Yeah just the kind of paint I'm using here. Now, if you were to use a higher quality paint and like, I would always recommend that I use a uh, Joe Sanjo, which comes in a tube like this. And this stuff is highly opaque. So it would probably only take two layers of this to actually solidify the model. And this stuff isn't all that more expensive. It's only about five bucks a tube. Um, probably lasts but, you forever. Yeah. And it lasts a long time. Yes, totally. So if you get into the higher grade paints, it definitely is an easier process overall. <laughs> well, when you need to kill time on a Saturday, yeah. it's raining. <laughs> Four or five <laughs> coats doesn't sound like such a bad idea. No, I know. I don't know if it's raining by you, but it's, uh, it's a rainy Saturday by us. So it's perfect. Yeah, it's not raining, but it's not sunny today. So, <laughs> um, so I'm going to jump into the next step. I know yep. this is going to be a little bit faster than where everyone else is at. Um, but I just found this slightly darker shade of soft suede. Um, so it's another tan color, but it's just, just a pinch um, darker than the tan. And you could, again, mix a similar color if you were to add a bit of white to burnt umber to create a slightly darker tan. So a little more umber, a little less white, um, mm -hmm. whatever works. So this is going to be kind of the bulk of the painting process and like how things are going to work. So I'll show you with just water and then I'll show you with the blending gel. But this is the step where you want things to be really thin um, because we're going to have to be, we're going to be like using the acrylic kind of like an oil paint almost, but it's going to dry really fast. So you have to work really quickly and you have to add a lot of medium or water to it so that it doesn't completely dry up on you. So if you can see my water and my palette mm -hmm. here. So I have the color here and I like to just pull it off of the edge ever so slightly. So I'm not dunking my brush into it. I'm really just taking a very fine amount of it. And I always kind of start on the top of the shoulder in kind of a, like a stippling round motion. It's not gonna be a, um, a stroke motion. It's gonna be more of like dabbing, circling. So you're kind of gonna like scrub the brush is what they call it usually in oils, I think. And I'm adding water and then kind of dabbing it off of my brush at the same time and adding just a bit of paint because I don't ever want too much happening on the brush at one time. 
it wants you want you don't it to want be, your brush to be soaking wet when you're dipping no. it into the acrylic just damp enough yeah and if you create a wet spot on your paper towel that also works to like add a bit of paint and kind of dip it into that wet spot so that it still has some water to it but it's not um not soaking yes so this would take a very long time building this up and you may have to do two or three layers of this as well just in this step uh, to create this color using water and it's mostly that you're just trying to soften the edge of that so that it doesn't look like you have paint strokes now the magic trick is using the blending gel and that makes things go a lot faster and a lot smoother you don't need very much of this either is there but a I question can... online? Somebody's asking if, do you think you would ever use this technique for a traditional model in the future? You could. It would take a very long time. <laughs> <laughs> I should challenge myself to do that one day because that would be very interesting. I think it bothers me a little bit because I really like the soft transition and it's very challenging to get that with acrylic. You'd be better off using airbrush or oils to achieve that. Oh, no, or pastel like actually sounds like a good challenge <laughs> maybe next Monday that's what we can do <laughs> all day painting one mile yes yeah. <laughs> one layer yes. okay so uh, for the blending gel I'm going to take kind of a little bit more of this paint and we can actually just kind of go for it on the model and I'm going to work relatively fast because I don't want it to dry. But what exactly does the blending agent do for you? It extends the drying time. Okay. So it makes it so that it doesn't dry so fast and it does a really nice job of just blending the paint out. So when the paint is still kind of wet, we can add some of that blending gel to it and do that scrubbing motion as well. And it's gonna like automatically just soften those edges for you without you having to work so hard. And you can and so add. If you don't have the blending gel. You were showing everyone first with water how it yeah. can be done. It just will take the water just has a chance of drying quicker than the blending gel. Yeah, and if you're using too much water, you can pull up the base layer. So you have to be. It's 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 a refined skill that takes some time and some practice, definitely, to achieve. Um. But the gel is definitely the cheat code here. <laughs> <laughs> and this gel dries into a really nice matte consistency. So you're not going to see it. Like even if I covered this whole horse skin blending gel, it would dry to the same consistency of the paint. So you really can't screw it up. It's, it's pretty awesome stuff. That's great. Um, so for this layer, I am focusing on kind of the top of the neck. Here, I'll move my paint dry. Top of the neck, we kind of want to go down in the shoulder. We want to do the, the top of the leg here into the knee. But on chestnuts, they generally have a lighter uh, fetlock area. So you want to leave that your base color. Also in the flank, you want to leave your base color. In the elbow armpit crease, you want to leave your base color. Um, in the crease behind the jaw, usually. And there's usually a spot above the muzzle. So if you study re reference of actual chestnut and horses, they have a pattern of the dark being more so on the top line and kind of avoiding certain areas of the body. So um, I generally try to do that when I'm painting. Another question, um, Christy on YouTube is asking, if you're blending the gel onto the model directly, or are you mixing it into the paint and then putting the mixed paint into onto the model? Gotcha. Um, I usually start with the paint. So I'll show again here. So if I just like, even just go on the hindquarters here, quite a bit of paint, like more paint than you would use if you were just blending with water and then blending gel just on its own. And we can kind of remove some of the paint off of our brush and add blending gel to the edges of that paint 
and it's going to blend in. I think you can, if you wanted to, you could mix a bit of this into the paint. It'll just be a slightly different technique. And this is just the technique that I found works for me. Um, but I have seen other people definitely just mix it in. I just find I have a little more control this way so I can really control where the paint is going and then where I need the blend to happen. So I'll show you the what it should kind of look like when you have that layer on. It's a little hard to see, I guess, because it's just a slightly darker shade. Yeah. But we have avoided the flank here. We've avoided kind of the underbelly a bit in the face. Uh, and it's just a really soft transition. Um, and then we're going to jump into the third layer, which is going to be the color that we are going to mix with all these weird reds and yellows that I told you you need. <laughs> um, so I took a red, a yellow, and a bit of burnt umber. And so this is where Chestnut has a varying degree. So we can go with this and we can keep building up tans and then we're gonna have a very brown chestnut. My sample is actually quite brown. She ended up being more so brown than anything, but there's a range of orange chestnut, red chestnut. You can make it a lot warmer if you want to. And this is the opportunity to do that with these colors. So I'm gonna take a generous amount of yellow this red is really hot, so I have to use very little amount of this red. It was like fire engine red. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we're creating basically your normal orange where you would mix red and yellow to make orange. Um, but I want that orange to be orange, not too, too red. Uh, so if I do that, I found that I don't need very much of this red to make an orange. Yeah, that was like the slightest dab. And we have a really soft orange chair. But then that like looks very cartoon-like and that's gonna make your horse literally look orange and we don't quite want that. Hmm. So we're gonna mix a little bit of burnt umber into that, which is your slightly darker brown. And this is totally your personal preference on how dark you want this to be, how orange you want this to be. So start with a little bit, see what happens to your color. And then you can add more if you're wanting things to be a bit more brown in tones. You could also add some of the soft suede or the tan in there and see what happens. Uh, but sometimes mixing these lower quality paints, things can get a bit muddy really quickly. So you just have to experiment. And sometimes mixing paints, you don't get the tone you're looking for the first time and you just need to remix and start it over. So that's- And totally like you said before, the good thing with the chestnuts is there's so many different colors ranging from light and dark. Like if you don't make the right paint that you want right away, you can always yeah. keep going with it and make it a darker one. I mean, if you put this straight burnt number on there, that's the color of my horse, straight brown. <laughs> <laughs> Just call it a liver chestnut, you're good. There you go. <laughs> uh, we have another question from YouTube. It says, would this technique work for an Appaloosa as well? Uh, yes, I did an Appaloosa tutorial actually for, I guess it was a fun day um, yeah. a little while ago. So that is on, Briar YouTube. Mm -hmm. That's for painting a leopard Appaloosa. So that's a bit different. There's not really blending in that technique. It's more um, painting all the spots, washing over the spots, painting more spots. Um, but if you wanted to do this as a base for the Appaloosa, 100% to create your base coat, you could even leave out the hindquarters of the horse if you were doing a blanket Appaloosa so that you don't have to paint so much white. Um, so all of these methods kind of interchange into each other. I don't feel like you can ever have enough knowledge 
that doesn't and apply to some area of painting. <laughs> I think I did that fun day with you. And all of a sudden you're like, okay, and now wipe it clean. And I was like, are you, are you sure? <laughs> we just spent a lot of time doing that. <laughs> yeah. The Appaloosa is a labor of love. That's for sure. <laughs> that, was, that, that was a leap of faith, my friend. I was like, <laughs> I'm not sure I want to do that, but it came out beautiful and we trust your methods. So, <laughs> yes. Um, so the same for this color, this is just layer three. We're just building this up in darkness. So even more so, I kind of want to avoid the flank the underside. So this is going to still actually leave some of that soft suede color that you've applied. So we're only going to be applying this to the very top of the horse, the um belly of the horse but we're still gonna leave a little bit and are you continuing to use your blending gel or water technique here as well yes for this whole horse basically this is the technique <laughs> um you could go in at any point too and attempt to add dapples if you wanted to um I'm ahead of ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't for this because I just felt like that was a bit much. This is already a learning curve on its own and then throw dapples in the mix and it's a whole other can of worms. So you could just remember that dapples are always a lighter tone of color on the body rather than darker. Reverse dapples do happen, but they're often much more rare. And what's your favorite? I know we're doing a chest, we're doing a chestnut. What's your favorite color to your go-to to paint? That would be a buckskin, uh, specifically like a sooty buckskin. I really like the dark shoulder with the really dramatic contrasty dapples. I really like contrast. So a buckskin is contrast. It's a light body with black legs and black shoulders sometimes. So okay. it's super super fun to paint but I also would say I really enjoy Appaloosa because there's a a great challenge to that and they just are so cool the patterns that they can have so on the the head area I didn't really demonstrate that but we're gonna keep the paint to kind of the cheek bone and kind of the middle of the face so I'm almost even like painting a line in here. It might be kind of hard to see. And then taking the blend. There's a question online that I don't understand. So if Pine Hollow Stables, if you can, are you mixing, ask, are you mixing them? But I'm not sure what them refers to. So if you could clarify that question, I'd be happy to ask. I just not sure what you're asking. So are you guys using the blending gel here today or? We're just using, using water. We are using the water <laughs> technique, <laughs> which is working out not bad for us. Yeah. No, no, it's uh, we're, it's coming along. <laughs> awesome. They look like chestnuts from here. <laughs> we're, we're working. We're so keeping it. We're keeping a solid <laughs> distance for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> our, our artistic skill is nowhere near <laughs> yours, but we're, we're having so much fun. Oh. Awesome. I love it. Hey, there's a whole art category where you're supposed to look at the piece from a distance anyway. So. <laughs> you squint a little bit, turn it on its side. Exactly. <laughs> I recently did a paint course actually that was about that. It was about being as loose and simple as possible, but still having the realism incorporated. And it is a challenge because you want to cram in all the details, but you don't necessarily have to in a lot of cases. Your eye fills in the detail for you. So this is looking pretty good. This particular color that I mixed was making this horse look a little bit more orange than brown. So that's kind of your true sorrel orange chestnut. Now the sample I completed that's been dried is a little more red, I found. Okay, yeah. Oh, wow. So you can really see there that the flank has been left out and the elbow and around the face in certain areas. And I mean, 
on my sample, same kind of idea, but she turned out actually quite brown in comparison. So it totally depends on that layer and what you mix for your paint. You can see the difference. That's, but these, That's a huge difference. These are both chestnuts and they both are considered chestnuts. So yes. for sure. <laughs> uh, a couple questions. Um, Brianna is asking what kind of paint we're using. We're just using deco art, crafters paint, nothing super fancy, just basic dollar store paint, uh, whatever you've got laying around. And then there's a question about the dapples. How would that work with the blending gel? Would it be the lighter color with the blending gel over the darker color to make the dapples? How would you suggest tackling dapples? Yeah. Um, I mean, you could do it in this layer and then kind of add a layer over top, or you can do it on the next layer. So I'll jump ahead just to explain that. So this is my mixture of yellows and reds. And then my next layer is adding kind of a sepia or not sepia, burnt umber tone over top. So you could put the dapples in this layer and then add your slightly darker tone over top of the dapples to soften them. Or you can put them directly onto this darkest layer. And that would be adding, I would probably take the soft suede color I used or even the tan color I used. And I would have to use my smaller fine point brush and kind of add them in. I mean, I could add them in right now on this guy a little bit. And you want to create a spot and it's the same idea. You wouldn't want to um, dab a solid dot on the horse. The dapple is a very soft edged marking. So you don't want very much paint and it's kind mm -hmm. of a I would make like an X pattern almost on the horse and not using very much paint. And you want the brush to kind of do the work for you. Like these bristles are kind of going everywhere and it's creating, it's creating a realistic looking dapple without me having to like ask for it. So that would almost be a dry brushing method rather than a wet brushing method. So you don't want like any water here. And then after the fact, you could run some blending gel over top in kind of the direction of the hair growth. And that might pull up a bit of that paint and soften it a bit. You would have to play with it depending on uh, what paints you're using and how you're going about it. But uh, the dry brushing technique for sure. I also really like these. Uh, they're like little micro applicators. Oh. oh, wow. That's super tiny. So it's like a plastic stick and then it has a little fuzz ball on the end. Mm -hmm. And it works really good for dapples because you can just dab that in the paint, dab it on some paper towel and then dab it on the horse and it yeah. looks like a spider dapple. Perfect. That's really cool. <laughs> so I did that a few times in my acrylic stable mate work so um so then the last layer that we have here is adding the burnt umber and i mean depending how dark you want your chestnut to be you could mix a darker color of the one that we just mixed to add on top or we can go straight umber and kind of make it livery more dark totally up to you uh, for my sample i did use the burnt umber so it's the same technique, but we're gonna wanna be cautious with this so that we don't get like too brown overall. Um, and really applying that to the top line the most and being careful not to go, not to cover everything we just did. Like you want these layers to be thin so that you can see the bottom color peeking through. So you're staying even higher than the last layer for the for number. You're really just going the top line. Uh, yeah, pretty much. And you can go like a little bit into the belly, but not too, too much. Um, but generally the top line and the shoulder is the darkest point. And then it looks like we have a question. Um, is there, if they don't, if, Whoever is watching and painting and following along doesn't like how it ended up. Is there a way to take the paint off? Is do you just suggest restarting, or do you just suggest going with your mistakes and making whatever you like? <laughs> uh, that's a tricky question. That's a great question. Um, I personally believe that 
you need to tough it out. <laughs> ah. There always is a phase in every project where you want to throw it out the window and you hate it and you think it's the worst thing you've ever made. But there's always an ugly phase where things are just sorting themselves out. And if you push past that phase, usually you get to the other side and you realize, wow, I made that piece and that's um, actually super cool. I think, um, what was my train of thought there? Having it out, it's also, is it worth it? <laughs> yeah, it's also really good practice, I think, to push yourself to finish the piece. And then even if the piece isn't exactly what you thought it was going to be, you at least learned something from pushing through. And then you can choose to give that to a family member that you don't really like or something. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So all of you people that get beautiful gifts from Darian. <laughs> how much you really like them uh, usually the the work that I sell is the work that I don't fall in love with I keep the pieces that I really oh, love fascinating um, but you can also if you know you're really not happy with it and you don't have other models to paint and you need to remove the paint if you were just to wash this in hot water the paint would slough off um this acrylic paint is not it's super water soluble so it will just completely come off and you can scrub it with a little scrubby brush and it will yeah you can just restart even once it's dry yeah really it comes off in almost like a gooey layer oh, okay. <laughs> um I find with the higher acrylics the airbrushing and if you're doing sealer in between layers you're going to have to use an agent to actually strip the model. Um, but then that's a whole process in itself and it can be messy and it can ruin the plastic sometimes. So you have to be really careful, but if you're not sealing anything, yeah, this will just come right off. Fascinating. If you let it soak for a little bit, it will definitely come off. So with these darker colors too, we're going to have like, a bit more separation in the pigments you're going to notice like it's a bit more streaky than some of the previous layers just because we're jumping from quite a light color to a very dark color so don't get discouraged wait for it to dry add more layers on top and then even when this whole course is dried kind of like this we can go back in and soften it by using the soft suede or the tan color on top. And that's going to make a different tone. And you can like re-accentuate your flank, re-accentuate your armpit or your muzzle and make it lighter again um, by adding in that tone again. So you really can't screw up with acrylic. You can pretty much redo anything that's not quite right. Uh, your tones are going to be a bit different. So the layering method of starting light to dark is your best bet, but you can add these, these tones back in for sure and brighten up the areas that need brightening and even softening some of that brown. Um, to go darker, if somebody's asking if their their model's looking more buckskin than chestnut, just add more of that burnt umber color. Looking more buckskin than chestnut, as in it's looking more yellow. Because they're using, can we use brown? Because mine is looking like a buckskin. Well, I remember when we were doing the beginning layers, it kind of looked like it was almost palomino. Yeah. Palomino y. And the more we put the layers on, that color actually started to change and darken. Yeah. It's true. And I know, Darian, you mentioned, you know, if it's not really looking, keep going because it mm -hmm. goes through that, you said that ugly looking phase mm -hmm. and it, it did change color. I mean, I it watched did. Jamie and I's yeah. change color. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, a buckskin and chestnut and bay even, they often can look very similar to each other. And really the only defining feature would be your chestnut would have a brown hair, your palomino would have white and your buckskin would have black. Mm -hmm. So the tones are all very similar. Obviously buckskin is a bit more golden, so is palomino, but there's chestnuts that come in that really light tone as well. And they just have that chestnut mane that makes them chestnut. Mm. So 
color genetics are complicated. <laughs> Um, it was fascinating. I mean, you have to have really just like a total patience to sit and sort of blend and wait and blend and wait. And the hair dryer, I think, would be yes. uh, quite the quite the help in this process. Yes, but I mean, in in putting that in perspective, this the sample I did um, of the chestnut here. This took me like a whole day to paint. Oh wow! So oh okay. It does it does take some time, <laughs> um, especially if you want that to be really soft and really blended. It just, it just takes time working that paint so back and forth. You have no metallics in there or anything. I mean, it looks from the sample, just maybe it's the light hitting it. It looks like you have like a layer of, and you did nothing. There's no metallic in there. That's just, no just layering. This is sealed. So the sealer is a bit semi-gloss. So it gives it okay. that sheen. But the undertones, no, there's no, no sparkle in that one. With all the, the colors you shown yeah. us here. That's very cool. That's unbelievable. <laughs> so your layers, you would spend more time on each layer for sure. If you really want it to have that glow. Um, and now that is something that you could do too, that could be really fun. You could add a layer of, um, metallic or glittery color in there. I would put that more at the bottom. So in that original tan color or the soft suede color um, and then add normal color over top or else it's gonna look like a fantasy horse. Uh, you have it's to be a little careful. To add it so early that it kind of gets hidden almost. Yeah, and you have to be careful too because some glitter paints have a really thick glitter to them and they're gonna make a lot of texture on your horse. Mm. Want to pick one that has a fine grain or a um, the pearl X pigment is pretty good. It's pretty uh, soft and fine. Somebody's asking about do you use similar techniques like this on other colors or just chestnuts? Would this work for a bay? Would it work for a palomino? You said they're very similar, but what about a gray? I guess. Yeah, so you can use the same techniques. For sure. I mean, in my painting process of my finished work that I'm kind of known for, I do all of my base work with airbrush. So it's the same kind of idea. You're using the same tones and mixtures. You're just airbrushing them on instead of dry brushing them on. And then in my final layers, so these darker layers and the layers with the dapples and everything, I actually use pastels. And oh. pastels are a lot easier to use because they are very soft and they blend really easily. So you're able to get that soft edge, the soft blend, and you're able to pull dapples out of them too with an eraser. So that's a whole different technique. A whole other one. <laughs> but pastels can also be really helpful um, if you're frustrated by this method of just hand painting acrylic. Hmm. I think that the best outcome is when you use more than one medium together. Mixed media is always the best because you can yeah. use the strengths of each to work with you. Um, so yeah, we're coming down to the wire here. So I'm gonna just show a little bit um, of kind of the finishing off details here. So like when we are done the body and we're happy with everything, we can also paint the mane and tail. I find painting the hair a really awesome technique for a lot of these briar molds that have really nice hair texture to them is just painting it your darkest tone first. So on this, I've painted it solid burnt umber, but this model, I don't know, tail's probably easier to see. We have like a lot of the sculpting detail here. So we have mm -hmm. lots of deep troughs and kind of high points. So if you paint the whole thing, the darkest tone, and then you go back in and you add your lighter colors on the tall parts of the sculpture, it's going to leave the shading in the wells ah. and it's gonna create that really dramatic depth, which a great tip. Yeah. I really like shade over shading my hair. It doesn't always look as realistic, but I think it really accentuates the sculpture and that's kind of the purpose of my particular paintwork. So 
Um, so I'm just going to take that smaller brush. I'm going to go in with the soft suede first and kind of add just some layers, some lines on the top. Fun. What's going on? It's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> no, these are all like really great techniques. Awesome. And we would love to see what everybody else is painting at home. Post photos of your models and when you're done or along the way. We'd love to see all that stuff. Yes, totally. And these tutorials are all going to be posted to our YouTube channel so you can go back and rewatch it if you've missed anything along the way. Take your time. Yeah. Or you want to yep. just remind yourself <laughs> of one of these amazing little tidbits, nuggets of knowledge we've all gotten today. <laughs> and with painting the hair, and you want to create a really nice soft line when you're using that lighter color over top, adding a significant amount of water to the paint is going to be really helpful. So this paint, when you add quite a bit of water to it, it almost turns watercolor-like. So there I have added a bit of white on top. So you can see that that's really making the sculpture pop. And then on the very tips, often in chestnut, kind of the tips of their hair will be a little bit lighter than the, the base of their hair that grows out of the neck. And that's just because they are hard on their hair and they get frayed tips and the sun bleaches in the sun, just like our hair does when we're left in the sun. But on horses, it's quite dramatic and they have that coarser hair happening. So usually the ends of it are quite a bit lighter. On a black horse, you'll often see um, the red tones kind of peeking through on the tips of their mane and it can look really cool. So I'm just gonna do that with the even lighter tone of tan just on the tips of the mane. There's a lot of different tips and tricks for each part of the horse that you're, you know, that you're painting. It seemed like you've figured out, <laughs> you, you must have been doing this for a long time to figure out all the different tips and tricks, like to do, get the tail right, to get, like you were saying, the flanks and the elbows and the the top of the mane. That, that's pretty impressive. Well, and I think a lot of people forget that. They think, you know, they should just be able to do this kind of first go, but this, this has been seven years of painting, wow. so. It takes a long time. <laughs> and I was always told that it takes 10 years or the 10,000 hour rule to really get good. And okay. I'm not even there yet. <laughs> wow. Only amazing things to come yeah. for you, for sure. This has been really, really fun. I hope everybody is enjoying following along. I mean, the difference between like, this is our sort yeah. of first color coat and then kind of... Yeah second color going in, we we're focusing kind of in different areas, yeah. but I mean, the layering and the building it's of color, so cool. it's such a game changer that, I mean, I think most people are like, oh, how'd you get that color? And, you know, you didn't realizing, start out with no. a brown or a chestnut pre-made color. <laughs> yeah. I think the, and the, the addition of how much red you're going to add going from like an RNG to a more darker. I mean, it really, it makes a huge difference in just layering those colors up. It's it's, it's wonderful. I mean, my, I had a little trouble around the neck with all the water. I added a little too much water on the top. So it's still drying there, but it was, it's really fun to blend it through and just kind of take your time with it. And we hope everybody at home had as much fun as we did following. Yeah. Along. Any yeah. last minute tips or tricks, any last little things people should keep in mind when finishing their models? Um, not particularly. I think I shared mostly everything. I mean, you can go in when you're done with a, a gray tone around the eye and around the muzzle. Uh, mm -hmm. Chestnuts don't have dark points, so they're not going to have a black muzzle. They're not going to have um, that like mask even. It's going to be kind of a shaded gray tone in there. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can add markings as well. That's another thing I noticed on your guys' is there. We've got some like white socks peeking out. <laughs> Just wear our fingers. <laughs> yeah, my, my fingers really created cool. the white socks all the face. <laughs> you need a glove. <laughs> I just um, paint our tail just, so I can hold it. <laughs> yeah, you can uh, detail the uh, hoops and then make sure that you seal everything up with a good sealer. 
Um, and then you can gloss the eyes. I find when you gloss the eyes, it suddenly looks like a horse. So <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. I hope that that was somewhat helpful. It seems like it was. Yeah, it was great. We loved it. I think, like, thanks again for everybody. If anybody has any last second questions, you're getting lots of love and thanks online. <laughs> Everyone's very, very happy. Oh, this is very sweet. You have inspired me to paint with acrylics. I've never wanted to before, but now I do. Thank you. Bye. Right. Thank you. Bye.